Hello everyone, my name is Kuro Sharfani and I am sociologist and the writer of the book Infinitism. Uh, infinitism is the theory according to which uh, we would have the possibility to uh, get everything we want uh, from the material uh, world if we know to explore the infinitude that is in the uh, fabric and the texture of matter. So uh, we said that in order to realize this possibility, uh, we should know uh, better and better the infinity that is going on in the universe. And that's why we need a discipline uh, for that. We need the methodology and a framework. That's why uh, we are trying to establish a new discipline that is called infinitology and uh, we are discussing in this uh, set of presentation about uh, what kind of methodology we need for the infinitology, uh, how we can approach the infinitude which is one of the most complex reality of the universe. So, in order to do that, uh, we said that we should refer to the, you know, uh, the references, the sources, the book, and one of the these books uh, that uh, uh, is very interesting for what we want to do is the book of uh, the uh, Austrian philosopher of science. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Paul Fairband, and uh, our objective uh, uh, by he uh, by the lecture of his book against method is to see if there would be any uh, specific uh, uh, methodology that we can use for what we want to do as infinitology. So we are uh, making a lecture of this book. Uh, in this uh, set of uh, presentations and uh, we have already finished the introduction and the chapter one and also the chapter two. Now we are uh, working on the chapter three and before starting the chapter three I would like to uh, uh, remind the conclusion that we got from the last part of the chapter two. The conclusions are here. Uh, there are three points. And the first one is methodologies are not exclusive nor totally inclusive, which means that there wouldn't be any uh, methodology with a, a specific uh, a status, right? Uh, we should consider the different methodology as equal, as useful, and we should not give uh, um, a, an excessive priority or excessive preference to any uh, uh, methodology. The second point is that any methodology merits or deserve being considered to enrich the work. So we can uh, take into uh, account uh, any methodology uh, because Either they are uh, useful and can help us, either they are not and can uh, again help us to uh, uh, to know more and to know better about what we are doing. Also, uh, the third point is by paying attention to the uh, alternative, we don't disregard the main theory, right? By paying attention to the alternatives, we don't disregard the main theory, but help it to find its deficiencies. So the uh, alternatives came, um, uh, come to help the main theory to improve itself. Now, uh, let's uh, start uh, with uh, uh, what we can uh, have as uh, why we lose... <laughs> Here is the uh, book Infinitism. All right, let's uh, start with uh, 
what we want to do as the lecture of the order. Uh, <laughs> we have a mess here. Let me uh, put everything at its place so that we can start. Uh, here we are. All right. Uh, now we start the, uh, the lecture of the chapter three of the book against method from Professor uh, Paul Fairband, and we will see what are the interesting points for what we are doing. All right, uh, we start with uh, the first paragraph. He says, in this chapter, I shall present more detailed arguments for the counter rule that urges us to introduce hypotheses which are inconsistent inconsistent with well-established theories. Uh, the arguments will be indirect. They will start with a criticism of the uh, demand that new hypotheses must be consistent with such theory. Uh, there is effectively a demand in science that uh, uh, is recommending us to suggest uh, the hypothesis that should be, that must be consistent with the well-established theories, right? How we call this demand? This demand will be called the consistency condition. And in the footnote, uh, uh, Fairband is telling us this, the consistency of condition goes back to Aristotle at least. It plays an important part in Newton's philosophy, though Newton himself constantly violated it. It's taken for granted by many 20th century scientists and philosophers of science. So you see that the subject of this chapter three is a serious one because he is talking about the uh, one of the uh, sine qua non condition of the uh, any scientific uh, work, which is the consistency condition, and we will see what it is and how we have to deal it when it comes to have a freedom for uh, having a better approach to the reality. So, prima facie, the, the case of consistency condition can be dealt with in a few words. What is this consistency condition? It's well known that Newton's mechanics is inconsistent with Galileo's law of free fall and with Kepler's laws. So, inconsistent, right? The statistical thermodynamics is inconsistent with the second law of the phenomenological theory, right? Again, inconsistent. The wave optics is inconsistent with geometrical optics and so on. So we have three examples at least here that shows there would be instead of the consistency condition, there would be inconsistency. Uh, there are the theories that are inconsistent with the previous ones. Now, note that what is being asserted here is logical inconsistency. Uh, only logical inconsistency. It may well be that the differences of prediction are too small to be detected by experiment. So these are not the experimental inconsistency, but the logical one, right? That's very important to distinguish them. Note also that what is being asserted is not the inconsistency of, say, Newton's theory and Galileo's law. Uh, there is no inconsistency in, uh, in this uh, framework, but 
rather the inconsistency of some consequences of Newton's theory in the domain of validity of Galileo's law and Galileo's law. So you see that here uh, we are talking about uh, only some consequences and not all the consequences, not all the theory, not all the aspects of uh, what each of these theories contains, right? In the last case, the situation is especially clear in the case of the Galileo's law, right? Galileo's law asserts that the acceleration of free fall is a constant whereas application of Newton's theory to the surface of the Earth gives an acceleration that is not constant. Uh, the Galileo's law asserts that the acceleration of free fall is constant. When you go with the new, uh, Newton theories, you see that this acceleration is not really constant when it's a, a, a question of the surface of Earth why? Because this speed is decreasing. Huh? It's not constant, but it decreases also imperceptibly with the distance from the center of the Earth. So, we see that it's a question of a difference in the reality, in the facts. Now, to speak more abstractly, Consider a theory to uh, Tiprin that successfully describe the situation inside the domain Tiprin. So Tiprin agrees with a finite number of observation. For example, we take this finite number of observation as f, and it agrees with this observation inside a margin of error m. Now, any alternative that contradicts Tiprin outside f, outside the finite number of observation, but inside of the margin is supported by exactly the same observation and is therefore acceptable if Tiprin was acceptable. Right? So he says that I shall assume that f which means the uh, finite number of observations are the only observations made. There is no other observation, right? So, now, what is the output? The consistency condition is much less tolerant, right? Much less tolerant, which means that we cannot, with the consistency condition, we cannot accept such a, a hypothetical case, right? With this kind of uh, uh, margin of error for a finite number of observation, if there is any lag, if there is any differences, any discrepancies, right? So, the consistent con consistency condition is much less tolerant it eliminates a theory or hypothesis. Why? Not because it disagrees with the facts, because we saw that the facts are such that we can accept that, we can approve that, right? It's not because of this. It eliminates it because it disagrees with another theory. With a theory, with which theory? with a theory whose confirming instances it shares, you know, which means that this condition, this consistency condition is refuting another theory. Why? Because uh, this new theory is not sharing completely the confirming instances uh, that are similar with the old theory. Right? So that's why the new theory is refused, is disapproved. So when the consistency condition is doing that, what 
does it make? It thereby makes the as yet under untested part of that theory a measure of validity, right? Which means that the theory that is considered as the well-established theory has a untested part, right? But but uh, we are uh, taking it as the indicator of the measurement of measurement of what of validity of this new theory so uh, what is the real judgment what is the uh, uh, factual situation about these two theories here we have the answer the only difference between such a measure and the more recent theory is age and familiarity you see here it's a question of the tradition. It's a question of establishment. The fact that a theory is well established or not. So that's why Professor Furban is telling us, had the younger theory been there first, then the consistency condition would have worked in its favor, right? If only it had this chance of have having been uh, suggested before, before the well-established theory. So, the first, which means the old one, the first adequate theory has the right of priority over equally adequate aftercomers. Uh, and uh, we should know that we have this situation almost everywhere. Uh, in. Uh, even in the social science, uh, because as a sociologist I know that, uh, in the uh, social science we have uh, a new work that comes with a lot of interesting and original ideas, you know, but the jury, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the professors, the academics, refuse this new work, uh, sorry, the new work. Why? Because they said that you didn't reproduce the well-established theory of sociology in your work. This is something completely new, and we cannot accept that. So if you want that your thesis, for example, uh, is accepted by the academics, so you have to somehow insert in your work those familiar theory, right? Those uh, old theories that can help to the academics, those who want to judge your work, uh, to have, you know, some indicators that you are in the same tradition. You are in the same, you know, streamline. And then they can approve that. They can approve your work. Otherwise, no. So that's why uh, once this uh, once a theory is uh, really uh, institutionalized in the academic sphere, it's very hard to shake it, to move it. Why? Because thousands and thousands of students have to just reproduce it mechanically somehow. Uh, in order to just to be graduated, not to suggest any new idea. If you have a new idea, if you have a new theory, first you have to uh, shape it through these old theories, and then uh, you can say some um, little elements here and there as the new ideas. Otherwise, no. You know, and it's very, very. Uh, unfortunate. Now, in this respect, the effect of the consistency condition is rather similar to the effect of the more traditional methods of transcendental deduction, analysis of essence, and phenomenological analysis, linguistic analysis. You know, all the 
traditional form of analysis, right? So we are doing the same thing. Even though we are so-called modern approach, modern methodology, but if we are doing so, if we are judging the new theories based on this uh, uh, closeness to the old theories, therefore we are doing the same thing that these traditional methods, right? So that's why Professor Fairbairn says it contributes to the preservation of the old and familiar not because of any inherent advantage in it, but because it's old and familiar. And that's all, because we knew that. Because uh, it's there for uh, decades or centuries. So we have to respect that. <laughs> you know? So, this is not the only instance where on closer inspection a rather surprising similarity emerged between modern empiricism and some of the school philosophies it attacks. Right? Which means that on behalf of science we are doing the same uh, uh, approach, we are uh, doing the same job that uh, did the old philosophical schools, for example. Now, now it seems to me that these brief considerations, although leading to an interesting tactical criticism of the consistency condition, and to some first shreds of support for counter-induction do not yet go to the heart of the matter, right? Because that's the objective. He, he's trying to uh, give the credibility to the counter-induction. But he says that until now in this chapter 3, I didn't yet go through the core of the topic. So what are the use of these uh, suggested example, they show that an alternative to the accepted point of view which shares its confirming instances cannot be eliminated by factual reasoning, right? If you want to suggest a, an alternative for a well-established theories, uh, you can be sure that your uh, uh, alternative theory cannot be really eliminated by factual reasoning, right? They do not show that such an alternative is acceptable. So what they show. And even less do they show that it should be used. Huh? Uh, they cannot prove anything uh, by uh, demonstration, if you want. It's bad enough a defender of the consistency condition might point out that the accepted view does not possess full empirical support, right? It's not question really of the uh, empirical deficiency for the new alternative, for the new theories. Adding new theories of an equally unsatisfactory character will not improve the situation. Uh, you cannot say that the other theory uh, couldn't approve it and the new one neither. So uh, we are in kind of impasse. It doesn't improve the situation. Nor is there much sense in trying to replace the accepted theories by some of their possible alternatives. So, if you say that, all right, we will put aside the old one and take into account the new ones. So, it doesn't help uh, neither. Such replacement will be no easy matter. Why? Because a new formalism may have to be learned and familiar problems may have to be calculated in a new way. So, how we can do that? Uh, 
how we can uh, uh, elaborate a new formalism, right? So that's the solution. Textbook must be rewritten, university curricula readjusted, experimental results reinterpreted. So if we do so, what will be the result of all of this? Another theory, which from an empirical standpoint has no advantage whatsoever over and above the theory it replaces. So which means that we are taking A out and we are replacing by, by B. But we are attributing, we are assigning the same fake credibility, the same uh, unjustified uh, legitimacy, validity to the new one that we were doing for the former one. Ready? So that's why he says, the only real improvement, so the defender of the consistency condition will continue, drives from the addition of new facts. You know, so instead of some old statistic, old numbers, you know, we will have the updated data, for example. But it doesn't change anything structurally in the function of the theory. It just, it's a question of updating the data, the information, or uh, some new facts. But look what Professor Fairband is telling us about the new fact. Such new facts will either support the current theories or they will force us to modify them by indicating precisely where they go wrong. This is all the function of the new facts. Huh? So if uh, they can help us to reconfirm the current theories, so we use for them, or what we have to do is just uh, and to readjust them based on where they, uh, these old theory, these well-established theory had some deficiencies. And now uh, with the help of the new facts, we can effectively recompensate these shortages right but look the result of both cases in both cases they will participate real progress and not merely arbitrary change uh, which means that we are using the data to improve right to improve the old theories to improve the well-established uh, theory so we, uh, when we say improve, uh, means improvement, means advance, means progress, right? We are not really uh, doing a change that could be, a, you know, arbitrary change, a desired change, but an improvement. The proper procedure must therefore consist in the confrontation of the accepted point of view, right, with what? With as many relevant facts as possible. Uh, we can try them, we can test them, we can verify the validity of the well-established point of view with the facts, with the uh, new uh, relevant facts that we gathered in our methodological undertaking. So, the exclusion of alternatives is then simply a measure of expedience, expediency, right? So, if we want to put aside the alternative, what we are doing is just a, a kind of uh, uh, exclusion, right? Their invention not only does not help, right? the uh, invention of the uh, alternative. The invention not only does not help, it even hinders 
uh, progress by absorbing time and manpower that could be devoted to better things. So why we have to repeat uh, uh, not as much fruitful uh, as we can imagine way again and again? That's the question. Why we have to waste the resources for doing something that we know already the result, we know already the outcome. So that's why Professor Fairbairn says the consistency condition eliminates such fruitless discussion and it forces the scientists to concentrate on the facts which, after all, are the only acceptable judge of theory. So instead of, you know, uh, trying uh, uselessly uh, to defend a theory and justify, uh, trying to justify its, uh, you know, stat stature or uh, its uh, position in the pyramid of the theories, what we can do is go through the facts and try to see if this theory could bear the new facts or not, could carry out with the facts or not, can come along with the new data that we gathered from the new reality, new situation, new environment, for example, or not. So that's why he says, uh, this is how the uh, practicing scientists will defend his concentration on a single theory to the exclusion of empirically possible alternative, right? So we should avoid that. Why? Because after all, these are only and only facts that they are talking. They are judging a theory. They are measuring up a theory. So we don't need the endless discussions about the validity of a theory, right? Uh, uh, because uh, these discussions are trying to exclude, you know, an empirical approach, which is the main uh, part of the work of the alternatives. So, it's worth will repeating the reasonable core of this argument. He wants to emphasize on the main idea. Theories should not be changed unless there are pressing reasons for doing so. So what are the pressing reasons? The only pressing reason for changing a theory is disagreement with facts. You know, not disagreement with another theory because we can have a lot of theories. But when the facts are denying you, when the facts are untelling you, it means that there is some problems in your theory, in the validity of your theory, you know? So that's why uh, when we start to uh, establish the methodology of uh, our new discipline, infinitology, we should not be worried about uh, saying something that is uh, uh, contradicting the well-established theory about the infinity in physics or uh, in some other fields of science. What we have to take care of is just the facts. We should see if our assertion, our theory, our hypothesis is something that is uh, denied and disapproved by the facts or not. If not, we should not be worried about this. You know, we should not be worried about the contradiction of what we are saying with the well-established theory regarding the infinity. So, that's why we can read discussion 
of incompatible facts will therefore lead to progress. About what? Incompatible facts. Incompatibility between facts and theory. Discussion of incompatible hypothesis will not. You know, it's a question of two different uh, point of view and uh, nothing more. So that's why discussion of incompatible fact, yes, it leads to progress, but discussion of incompatible hypothesis, not really. There is no progress for that. That's why it's some procedure to increase the number of the relevant facts. If we do so, if we discuss the incompatible facts, then we will have more and more the relevant facts regarding the topic of the theory. It's not sound procedure to increase the number of factually adequate but incompatible alternatives, right? So we can talk about a lot of alternatives, but as long as we don't have, you know, the compatibility with the facts, so they are not really, they don't have uh, really uh, any value. So that's why it says one might wish to add that formal improvement, such as increased elegance, simplicity, uh, generality, and coherence should not be excluded, right? When we are discussing the, uh, uh, discussing the incompatible facts, what we are doing, not only we are increasing the number of relevant facts, but also we are improving the elegancy of the theory, its simplicity, its uh, generality, you know, the extrapolation uh, capability and coherence. But once these improvements have been carried out, the collection of facts for the purpose of the test seems indeed to be the only thing left to the scientific, scientist. What it left? The collection of facts, right? We gather a lot of data considered as fact in the framework of a mythological work. And uh, at the end of the day, we have just this one. We have just the, the a bunch of facts, right? And so it is. Provided facts exist and are available independently of whether or not considers alternatives to the theory to be tested, right? So the facts are there. Either they are compatible for what we want to do as the examination of our theory or not, we should know that they are there, they exist, they have an objective reality, uh, they are not depending on our research or our theory, our research is depending on them. Uh, we should uh, understand this logic. This assumption on which the validity of the uh, foregoing argument depends in a most decisive manner I shall call the assumption of the relative autonomy of facts, right? The facts have some autonomy. They have, uh, the facts have some independence with regard with what we are doing. So that's why you call that the autonomy principle, uh, the autonomy of facts in the real world, in the objective uh, 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 universe, whatever is the interpretation that we have over them. So, it's not asserted by this principle that discovery and description of fact is independent of all theorizing, right? When we start to classify them, to categorize them, we are working these uh, facts, right? We know this. So that's why they are not as the raw materials. Huh? 
we work on them we go over them and uh, we work them that's why they are not completely independent from what we are doing as the effort of theorization but but it's asserted that the facts which belong to the empirical content of some theory are available whether or not one consider alternatives to this theory so it means that we cannot just have a too much arbitrary interpretation of the facts that is all it means right which means that if someone wants to have the same empirical uh, approach regarding these facts and data whatever is the theory that he or she is doing uh, uh, using and whatever his theory is uh, whatever is the distance his theory has regarding ours for example anyway the facts are there as well uh, as well as for him that for us as well as for us that for him you know so that's why he said I am not aware that this very important assumption has ever been explicitly formulated as a separate postulate of the empirical method so we should know that the book has been written uh, 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 has been written in the 1993 so which means or uh, even more uh, even uh, 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 further than that because the first edition was in the 70s but we should know from that moment these uh, epistemological subjects had been worked uh, again and again by um, the different uh, philosopher of science or the philosophers in general however it's clearly implied in almost all investigation which deal with question of confirmation and test right in all investigation when it comes to the confirmation and test we have to think about the importance of the uh, existential independence of the facts with regard to our theory whatever is this theory so all these investigation use a model in which a single theory is compared with a class of facts or observation statements which are assumed to be given somehow right so uh, uh, we see that when it comes to the investigation right uh, we take one single theory we go through the facts and we try to uh, see if the facts are confirming our theory or not this is the classic uh, methodology of any almost any sciences uh, that uh, we are using at present so he said I submit that this is much too simple a picture of the actual situation uh, the real situation is more complex facts and theories are much more intimately connected than is admitted by the autonomy principle right which means that the facts are not completely insulated isolated from what we are doing as the effort of theorization and at the same time the, uh, any theory cannot be completely uh, construed you know uh, uh, regardless of the facts so not only is the description of every single fact dependent on some theory uh, description of every single fact depends somehow on some theory right which may of course be very different from the theory to be tested 
That's another story. That's the, uh, you know, the realm and the domain of science, the question of the test. But there also exist facts which cannot be unearthed except with the help of alternatives to the theory to be tested and which become unavailable as soon as such alternatives are excluded. So which means that if you want to understand the inclusiveness of the facts, you should go beyond one single theory and you should try to uh, 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 take into account the alternatives of this theory as well. If you want, if you want to understand the uh, the reality of the facts, you know how uh, 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 extensive, how extended is the understanding of the facts. You can do it. You can have it if and only if you take into consideration the alternatives of the of the theory. If you uh, are satisfied only with one single theory and you try to put there all the facts to give a meaning to the facts only and only uh, thanks to one single theory, what you are doing is to running short of the meanings, senses, applications, implications of the facts. So that's why you need the alternative for this theory in order to better understand and to understand the deeper level of the facts, right? So this suggests, this suggests that the methodological unit to which we must refer when discussing questions of test and empirical content is constituted by a whole set of partly overlapping, factually adequate, but mutually inconsistent theory. You know, you see how uh, uh, the point of view of Professor Fairband is uh, somehow, uh, you know, a cross examination of the fact. If you have one single, uh, you know, uh, 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 lens, you cannot see but through this lens. But if you have several ones, you can see what are the difference of view, what are the different vantage points through the different lenses, right? And these lenses are effectively the alternatives to your main lenses, which is your theory. And what's interesting here is said that uh, we start to better understand when we know that these theories, these set of theories that we are using to have a better understanding of the reality are mutually inconsistent, which means that we avoid to pick only and only the compatible, the consistent theories, right? And even preferably, we should go through the inconsistent, mutually inconsistent theories. And then we will get a better understanding of the uh, empirical efforts that we are doing and our test of validity of the theory will be uh, uh, even uh, improved. And finally, we can read in this paragraph, in the present chapter, only the barest outlines will be given of such a test model. However, before doing this, I want to discuss an example which shows very clearly the function of alternatives in the discovery of critical facts. So here we have the example 
that we will study together in the next presentation. All right, we are in the middle of the chapter three of the book Against Method from the professor Paul uh, Feyerabend and uh, we will continue in the next presentation, the next video, the chapter three. Thank you very much for watching this video. Bye.